Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am Madeleine Takour. I'm president of the Children's Movement of Florida, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our Reading Pals conference and celebration. Most of you already know the Children's Movement. We're the state's leading voice on early childhood, championing policies and investments for high quality early learning, healthcare access, and parent support. And that includes the development of the Reading Pals program 10 years ago, along with the help of many supportive partners. We are grateful for all of the volunteers, teachers, parents, local leaders, and supporters who've been, who've been part of this work for the last 10 years, and for so many of you who have gathered to celebrate with us our um, 10 years of Reading Pals, our statewide early literacy and mentoring initiative. We'll be hearing from some special experts in the areas of early brain development, as well as childhood trauma and support, and we hope that you find this information today engaging, uh, educational, and inspiring. I must first thank the founders of Reading Pals who've made this work possible over the last decade, Carol, Barney, and Wesley Barnett. Their family support has allowed us to offer Reading Pals in 15 Florida regions, providing volunteer mentors to thousands of young students over the years. We're truly grateful for their leadership and generosity. Um, now, a few housekeeping items to share before we get started. We are recording our virtual conference as well as broadcasting live on Facebook. So all of today's material will be available after the fact if you wanna share or listen again. Uh, we're using Zoom's live transcript feature. So if you'd like to read along, you'll see the CC live transcript button below. And we will make good use of the chat today, sharing resources, and we hope that you will too. Why don't we have everyone introduce themselves there now so we get a sense of, of who's here and where you're watching from. And if you wanna join the conversation on social media, use the hashtag reading pals, spelled the way you see just here over my left shoulder. We have only one hour uh, together and we've got a lot to cover to celebrate and learn together. So let's get started. Our first speaker this morning is my colleague, John Knight, Reading Pals Statewide Director for the Children's Movement of Florida. John has been shaping Reading Pals since its inception, bringing to life the Barnett family's vision of prioritizing early literacy and mentoring in Florida. And over the years, he's worked closely with United Ways and others to build and support all the local programs in communities. John, over to you. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, it's incredible to think that 11 years ago, Representative Vance Lupus, Dave Lawrence, and I all traveled to Polk County to meet with Carol and Barney Barnett, uh, where we all discussed the idea of building an early literacy initiative in Florida. They were insistent that we needed to find mentors for young children in our local communities that may need some extra help, and more specifically, a one-to-one -one relationship where they could connect every single week through the love and joy of reading. Now, there's a number of different reasons why Reading Pals holds a very special place in my heart. And some of my fondest memories have been specifically as a Reading Pals volunteer in the classroom, the same classroom actually for seven years consecutively. The absolute highlight of my week, and for those that have spent time in the classrooms, know exactly what I'm talking about here, to be greeted so warmly, um, not just by my Reading Pals students, but literally by every student in the classroom, including one of the best teachers that I've personally met, Dr. Syra Mir. I was even invited to celebrate holidays with the class, uh, attend parties, and even host an end of year celebration where I was allowed to bring all my musical instruments for the students to try. My point here is that every year, my time in the classroom has always felt like family. My sincere hope is that you all have the opportunity to share some of these similar experiences. And if you haven't yet, that you do here in the near future. So I recognize that the last two and a half years, just about, have been incredibly difficult for everyone. COVID-19, at least for a period of time, changed the way that we go about our daily lives. So momentarily, no longer was it okay for a volunteer to enter a classroom. And the idea of face-to-face interactions became very scary for some. The sharing of print books temporarily, not even an option. Our program, which was built on face-to-face -face relationships was in real danger of shutting down. So I'm thankful for all the people that stood by Reading Pals as we were forced to pivot. Uh, in, the, in most cases, 
It was to a virtual format during the 2020-2021 school year, building the proverbial airplane in midair. Um, and this option for some maybe wasn't as attractive and understandably so for a lot of uh, reasons and, and logistics that we had to work through. Um, and so our numbers, students, and every measure of our reach and how we had defined success for Reading Pals over the eight years prior, um, they really suffered during this time. And I share this not, not all as a memorial of any sort for Reading Pals, but more so to point out that our program was the strongest it had ever been before the pandemic began back in early 2020, uh, where we provided mentors to nearly 3,500 young students possibly difficult school year and are in the process of recovery. But this is a long-term recovery that really does need all of your support. Uh, I'd like to show a few graphs to highlight my point, and we're going to move quickly through these. You're going to notice a few trends. So here's a look at a number of our participating classrooms over the last three years. Uh, losing access to the classroom is clearly shown in year nine, but you'll also see us trending back up uh, in year 10. Now on the next slide with our volunteers over the same time period, volunteer restrictions, closures, safety protocols left us with only a fifth of our volunteers still able to participate in some way, again, mostly virtual, but we are being welcomed back as you can see there in year 10. And the next slide shows the number of students matched over the same three year period. And you probably could have guessed uh, what this looks like on your own. So taking a look at the last graph, re last graph reaffirms all of this, that we are rebounding in every measurable way. Next slide, please. So nearly a thousand of you here today um, and others that couldn't join us today were able to come back um, or join the program for the first time, mentoring 1,500 students this past school year. And those students arguably need that one-on-one -on -one time now more than ever, giving nearly 30 5,000 books for our students to take home. And that is something for us to be truly proud of. So as you can see today, we still have a ways to go in order to match what we have accomplished previously, more than 2,300 mentors and 34 to 3,500 students annually. Um, and every single person here is a big part of that. You're all critical and we need all of your help. None of this works without our local partners, our coordinators, educators, parents, and the most represented group here today are volunteers. So in closing, I invite you to join us this upcoming school year, and I really hope that you will help us continue to build back stronger than ever. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. It, it's great to see the, the story that we all know from the last couple of years come alive in those graphs and, and really in, encouraging the continued impact uh, of Reading Pals as we rebound even further. Um, so now we move to our first guest speaker, Dr. Marley Jarvis. She is Outreach and Education Specialist at the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, iLabs, at the University of Washington. She works with early learning professionals, educators, parents, and policymakers to apply research findings to their work. And I learned that she started in this as a marine scientist studying plankton. And this is where she got started translating research for public audiences. And I think, um, Marley, you have a group here that agrees all of the brain science that needs to be translated to uh, the broader public. And so we're really eager to hear from you. And without any further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much for having me here. I mean, it's really wonderful that you guys have been doing this for 10 years. Um, and, you know, you kind of alluded to how challenging the last couple of years have been for children and families and programs, for sure. Um, education programs have really had their work cut out for them. So I think it's a really important time to kind of be taking stock and celebrating and also looking forward to what, what you want to do, how you want to respond. And, um, I just wanted to thank you all for the, the work that you do supporting children and families. Um, it's really nice to come out of the lab space, come out of um, research land and, and get to share a space with uh, folks like yourselves who are really out there doing amazing things, supporting children and families. So thank you first and foremost. Um, so 
Um, as was mentioned, my name is Marley, and I'm with the um, Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, uh, which is a large research institute at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I say large, there's probably about 80 or so folks there, uh, mostly doing research on early childhood development and early brain development, kind of focusing on zero to five years of age and, and slowly getting older and older, not much on adults, but, but some on uh, some of the teenage years and brain development as well, because there's fascinating stuff going on inside the, uh, those brains of teenagers. <laughs> But our, our primary uh, field that we're well known for is um, language development and brain development um, in those first couple years of life. Um, so that's largely what I'm talking about today um, is this idea of building our brain. Um, and so we'll kind of explore some of this science of early brain development from sort of a, a higher, higher level. The, um, what you're seeing on the slide here, that's the Twitter handle for iLabs, our institute. So feel free to follow us, learn more of some of the many different research studies we have going on. Um, next slide, please. So some of you have probably seen some of this data before. This is not particularly new, but it's a great place for us to start. Um, so what you're looking at is estimates of brain size um, by, by volume, if you're curious, or, or kind of weight um, at different stages throughout your life. So when we're thinking about a newborn baby, they are born with their brains about 25% of the adult size. Um, and they go from 25% to 70% of adult size just in that very first year, which is quite impressive <laughs> when you're thinking about it. Um, but, but, you know, I want to acknowledge newborns have pretty large brains already out of the get-go. So um, some way to put that in perspective um, is think of, of how much you weigh. You don't have to share it. <laughs> so just think in your head what you're, how much you weigh. And then if you divide that number by four, and think how, what a newborn that weighed that, <laughs> you know, that, that would be a hefty newborn. So thank goodness for birthing parents out there that that is not the case. Um, so the head is already a, a, a quite large proportion of, of a newborn's body. So 25% of the adult size at birth. But then you look, okay, to 70% by year one, to 85% of adult size by the time they're three. And then by the time they're going into kindergarten, so about five years, their brains are over 90% of the adult size. So this is often, you know, one of those statistics that I think gets um, thrown out there quite a bit and it's quite impressive. Um, but I did wanna clarify, you know, it's not by the time that they're five years old, children's brains are 90% done. There's a lot of brain growth going on, but it certainly, if you've hung out with a five-year-old, which it sounds like many of you have, um, you know that their learning is not quite done. Um, but this is just, an important illustration that there is a ton of brain growth and development and a really important period in our uh, life, especially in building this brain in the first five years. Next slide, please. And all of this is to say that we are growing our brains. So we have this massive construction project. Um, essentially when we're born, our brains aren't done. So what I was just showing you is, is quite a bit how our brains are not done. It's working and working and working. We're growing and growing and growing. Um, next slide. And you may have also seen this statistic. So um, children's brains are estimated to make about a million new connections every second um, from birth to age three. So it's another illustration. This is just an estimate. It's kind of hard to get really precise numbers, but it's a useful illustration of, oh my goodness, there is so much going on. <laughs> so while, you know, a toddler is kind of falling on their bum trying to walk or, or running around, <laughs> there's just lightning going on in their head is sort of how I like to think of it. Uh, next slide, please. So what those connections are is we're looking at a really simplified diagram of a bunch of neurons or these brain cells. Um, and the way your brain cells work is that they have these branches that form connections. And the connection is uh, called a synapse. So it's just this little space between the, the branches of your brain cells. And they're able to pass messages back and forth there. Um, so next slide, please. 
Um, and so again, this is sort of simplified. Now you imagine each brain cell making connections with what's shown here, a couple other neurons, but in reality, okay, we've got 86 billion neurons about, and then each one is estimated to connect to about 7,000 other neurons. So this is this incredible, vast, complicated network in our brains. It, some people think it's probably the most complicated uh, network in the known universe. And all of these connections are really key. So when we're learning something new, we're building connections between neurons in our brain. So I like to think of this, it, it's kind of, you know, when we're, we're thinking about early learning or what it means to learn something, um, these brain connections, that's what learning looks like at kind of the cellular level in your brain, which I think is really fascinating. It's kind of helpful to think about why all of these brain connections that are forming in the first five years of life, why that's so important. It's the, the cellular aspect of learning. Next slide, please. And we form new connections, but they also can get stronger. So when you learn something new or you're having an experience, especially a particularly meaningful one, and we'll talk about that, um, what happens in your brain is either you form more of those branches, more of those connections, or kind of what's depicted in the dark blue here on the right, the ability for that message to happen between a connection gets stronger. So you've got multiple ways in the brain for these connections to get stronger. And they get stronger with experience. So that's something I want you to remember. So it's not just that our brains are making tons of connections in our earliest years. Some of these connections, a large number of them, are driven by the experiences that we have. Next slide, please. So in a very real way, this is why you hear things about how our earliest experiences are you know, shaping our brains um, or forming the, the foundational architecture, if you will, of our brains. And it's not in a kind of metaphorical sense, it's in a direct cellular level way that our experiences are shaping our brain. And I did wanna point out that um, this doesn't mean it's set in stone. So we are not, you know, forever victims of, of how our brain gets set up. It's kind of one of these remarkable things that we've learned in recent neuroscience is about the, the plasticity of our brains. So this ability for our brains to change at any age. Um, but kind of just like building a house, it's sort of easier if you are, are getting that foundation before adding on to it. If you have to go and change the foundation later, that's a lot more expensive. <laughs> um, so we can certainly change our brains and do due to experiences throughout our lives. But, but these first five-ish years, those, those early years, really have a, a huge impact on that cellular level of our brain and how the structure is. Um, so importantly, it's not just any old experience, but our brains are particularly wired to make these kinds of connections from meaningful experiences with other people. Next slide, please. So I like to uh, think of this as our, our social brains. And research really tells us that our brains kind of have this uh, capacity and inclination for social connection um, from birth, really. Next slide. So for example, here's kind of a classic study and they're looking at newborns um, and, and newborns tend to turn and, and look to faces, particularly those that might be making eye contact with them. And even if you show them just these simple arrangement of shapes, so you've got A on the left and B on the right, and you know which one looks like a face to you, and, and most people are going to say B, right? <laughs> and sure enough, with a newborn, even in the first week of life, they're gonna look longer at B. They're gonna preferentially look at the one that even just barely resembles a face. Next slide. And it's why we might see faces in things, you know, like our, our neighbor's recycling can across the street. So our brains are just cued into anything that might be a social connection, might have information in that face we're just looking for it. It's sort of how our brains are wired. Next. And so in a really real way, 
again, down to the cells in our brain, the relationships that we build in our early years, um, they're, they're truly building our brains. Um, and I think that's such a powerful and wonderful message. Uh, next slide, please. So our brain development is occurring over many stages, many years, but there is this really wonderful uh, opportunity in early childhood. So again, we've got biology, of course, but also the experiences that we have in particular with people that are consistent, trusted adults in our life. So there's this wonderful window in early childhood to build those relationships with people like yourself um, that make such a huge impact on the architecture of our brain that then can impact us uh, for our life. Next slide. So when we're asking things like, how do we support healthy brain development for children? Um, especially in times like stress, like we've been talking about for these last couple of years, it comes down to how do we support strong relationships? And often then the answer is looking towards the adults. So reducing systemic and persistent stressors for the adults in their lives so that they can be that consistent adult there. So that's a really important thing, especially thinking back over the last couple of years. Next slide. So uh, there's just been an enormous amount of stress in the last few years. Um, and there, you know, not all stress is equal. This is something you've probably heard some about, but we tend to classify stress in terms of positive, tolerable, or toxic stress. Positive, you know, might be we, a short-term thing in our bodies. So uh, maybe heart rate and stress hormone increase for a short period of time, perhaps on a first day of school or something like that tolerable stress, we tend to refer to something that, that is serious, perhaps a natural disaster or, you know, death of a grandparent or something like that. Um, so there is, a, it's a serious event, but the temporary stress response is what we see in the body. As opposed to in, in toxic stress, we see more of a prolonged stress response. And you'll notice uh, in both tolerable and toxic, I've written here the words relationships, because relationships with other people are one of the key things that helps determine kind of which way this stress response is gonna be for us in our bodies. Um, next slide, please. And this kind of magic here of how our brains work and how this early brain development happens is that relationships end up acting as a buffer to these more serious impacts of stress. So you may have families in pretty rough conditions, and yet we don't see the toxic stress impacts on, on the body of those children if they've got at least one consistent caregiver in their life. So it's this really wonderful buffering effect. And it doesn't have to be a parent. It doesn't have to be a relative. It can be you know, somebody like yourself who's a volunteer or has a, a coach or mentorship or teacher type relationship, it can be a neighbor, truly just any consistent adult in their lives. Next slide, please. And what's most important more than time is the connection that you form with this person. Next slide, please. So in, in summary, you have this enormous power and I think it's such a wonderful opportunity in early childhood. And it comes down to these relationships and you really are a brain builder. And I think that's such a wonderful, inspiring and powerful thing. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to thank you for all that you do and for your time today and also direct you to a bunch of free resources that we have in case you wanted to learn more about uh, any of the, the work that we do at iLabs, but there's infographics and learning modules and a bunch of stuff that's all free. So feel free to screenshot that and view at your pleasure. But thank you all. Thank you so much, Marley. I think we will all be tuning into that website. And, and thank you for all those visuals you shared. I mean, I've got this, this visual now of that hefty newborn and the understanding of why we call the, you know, the hood of the car the nose sometimes. And there are certain brands that might look a little more like a face. And it just, <laughs> um, but, but the most important thing is what you say about meaningful experiences are what lead to that synapse growth. And the, the, relationship of early brain development, the importance of relationships in that. And that's what we're celebrating today here with 10 Years of Reading Pals. So thank you for, for sharing this and for the work that you do every day. I, I think it, you know it's one thing for us to talk about the impact of Reading Pals 
but we thought it would be best for you all to hear firsthand from dozens of our partners in Florida. So um, next we'll, we'll queue up a special video and you will see one thing is very clear, students, volunteers, teachers, parents, and partners truly love being pals. What does Reading Pals mean to you, Merlia? Well, it helps me learn and read a lot. One of my favorite things about being a Reading Pal is to watch the students grow in their uh, letter and word recognition as we read throughout the year. It's uh, very rewarding. I just see them happier and more engaged with the books. I'm a Reading Pal, and Celine's favorite book is... Peter! I get so excited and they go, I can read, I can read, I can read. And that for me is way more value than all the money you could give me. It has been so much fun and I feel like I'm making such a positive impact. Children can learn to read so they can read to learn. What was your favorite part? Um, I'm reading a book. And she's really intrigued about what she's learning and she's excited about learning. Reading Pals means the opportunity for those children to build a rapport and a relationship with someone who comes in enthusiastic, ready to read. I think this is maybe seven years I've done it and it's a great opportunity and I love it. We have two phenomenal mentors that work with some of our second graders. We have so much fun reading together. We love Reading Pals! I really like it because it helps me learn and it helps me like get like read big words and stuff that I didn't really know. They begin just by learning sounds and and phonemes and putting words together, blending. Our volunteers tell us time after time that this is the highlight of their week and our students love their pals. We get to see the gains our students are making in terms of early literacy, social emotional, and also just developing this trust in the world around them. I have done this for about five years now, even through COVID. It is the best part of my week. I can't tell you how fulfilling this has been. Watching their skills grow and watching yeah. them blossom and change oh, as we yeah. spend the semester together. I guarantee you that with the right mentor, a young person can reach their goals and their true potential. With our reading palettes, it's fun and we get that. We just do a bunch of things with our reading pals. Treehouse. Reading pals has helped Wyatt because he enjoys being able to sit down and read with someone new and hear new stories and get new books to read to add to our at home library. I see improvements throughout the year when it comes to their print knowledge and letter recognition as well. Devin, I think we've read 20 books, right? Mm -hmm. I learn new words, I get new books, and I also get to play games with him. Through that friendship, you're able to find what works best for them and establish a genuine connection for the sake of their education. What a joy it's been for this first year. I had so much fun that I'm going to volunteer next year also. We love to read together. I was really grateful to have an opportunity to make a one-on-one -on -one connection with my student. These mentors are a huge help to my classroom community. And sometimes it just takes another person to do it with them. And it just seemed to help. And my son was able to start reading books and get to the level he needed to be at by the end of his kindergarten year that he was able to con continue on to first grade, which I was so thankful for. I've been uh, doing reading pals for 10 years since it started here in the county. They learned so much from alphabet to reading to actually telling me what the characters are doing. It, it's been so much fun. I know how important reading and books and just being able to connect with another human being is to this age group. They give my um, students that are struggling a one-on-one -on -one support. I really appreciate their help. My favorite thing is about that farm animal. It is learning new words every day. I feel like it instills a love of reading with the children. 
The kids have been fantastic and it's been wonderful to watch them learn and grow. It is a great one hour of my week where I get to come spend that time playing with some Play-Doh, reading some stories to some kids. My students always enjoyed going to Reading Pals. They would count down the days until it was their turn. I like reading books about black people whose names are Martin Luther King and Rosa Park. And I like coming to Reading Pals. It's been an awesome opportunity to sit down on a weekly basis and have one-on-one -on -one conversations and try to really make an impact in his life. What was your favorite thing about Reading Pals? Um, that you get to learn? Reading books exposes him to lots of language, words, and concepts that they may not have had experience in their own personal life. My class has mostly English language learners as well as students with disabilities. So having the Pals come in and read one-on-one -on -one with the students has been very beneficial, not just academically, but socially as well. All the books. Which ones do you want to read? Uh, this one. I was a reading pal with United Way Sun Coast until I got my own little reading pal here. They have motivated them to learn. Having a mentor, especially at this age, is so vital to their growth, and they may not always get that one-on-one -on -one time that they all deserve, whether it's at home or in the classroom, so Reading Pals has really been a special time for them. I feel that I have made a difference. I feel that I have made an impact. I love Reading Pals! I love Reading Pals! How special. The, the passion and dedication for this program and the impact it continues to have is inspiring. And I particularly love seeing some of those names pop up in the video that I have also seen pop up in the chat. And so this is really a celebration of all of you who have made this program what it is over the years. Um, for all of our new and returning Reading Pals volunteers, please make sure to contact your local Reading Pals coordinators as soon as you can to sign up for the 2022-2023 school year. We're planning to bounce back even stronger this year and need your support. Um, so this is what happens when you promise a, a group of 200 plus people that we will have a fast paced session um, and, and pack so much into one hour. It is time to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Chandra Ghosh Ippen, child psychologist and award winning children's book author, who has a personal mission also to bake 1000 pies during her lifetime and is now somewhere in the 500s. So um, Chandra is associate director of the Child Trauma Research Program at the University of California. California, San Francisco. She's a co-developer of Child Parent Psychotherapy, CPP, and a member of the Board of Directors of Zero to Three. And over the last 30 years, in addition to conducting research, clinical work, and training for childhood trauma, uh, and publishing or co-authoring more than 20 publications, she's also written a number of children's books, and we're, we're glad to dive into some of that today. Um, I encourage our audience to share any reactions and questions as we go, and if we have a moment at the end, we can incorporate this into our conversation, but let me turn it over to you, Chandra, and give you as much time as we can. Thank you, and I'm so glad I got to have a chance to see the video because I'm imagining all of you in front of me, and I am honored to be able to read to the readers and to celebrate what you all do. So let's start with a story. The story that we're reading today is Holden Pot. Good day, my name is Mr. Holden Pot. I was taught that you got what you got. And when the heat is turned on hot, do not let it show. Cause all those feelings that start to bubble, they will surely cause you trouble unless your lid is on real tight and you hold it on with all your might. Sadness, anger, I keep them inside. Along with tears, I never cried. At times I fear I'll overflow, but that's my way. It's what I know. Little Pot watched and tried to be brave. Little Pot listened and tried to behave. But there were so many things Little Pot never told, too many things for Little Pot to hold. All by himself, pushed off a shelf, called dirty and dented by others who meant it. And all this made the stew thicken, lid quake and heartbeat quicken, body ache and belly sicken. Little Pot could not know what to do. So you know what he did? He blew. Then Little Pot felt ashamed and afraid. He'd be in big trouble for the mess that he made. 
But this time was different for when he blew, Holden Pot saw him and Holden Pot knew. The rumbling volcano he'd learned to contain, he'd held for too long that feeling of pain. So he went quickly, took little Pot by the hand, held him real tight and said, I understand you're feeling alone, you're burning inside, but I am right here, I'm right by your side. And if you are hurting and needing to scream, let's open your lid and let off some steam. Let's turn down the heat so you don't feel so hot, for you are my precious, my loved little pot. And in the warmth of Holden's love and embrace, tears started dripping down little pot's face. Little pot felt so loved and was now not alone, for in Holden's pot's arms, he found safety and home. Now, the other pots watched and knew what is true, that pots who tease need holding too. So all of us big pots, we know what to do. And I just wanna thank you all for everything that you do every day um, and watching that video really brought it home. And so let's think together about what people have been holding in. I know that that's something that we don't like to think about, but if we think about our bodies like pots, and we think about what is inside your pot and what does this do to you? And the idea that sometimes culturally we've been taught to lid it. It may be important to look inside because what we're learning is that when you lid your pot, it affects your body. And that's what the science is telling us, the science of stress and trauma. You might've heard about the ACE study is that when we've had difficult experiences in childhood and as we have more of them, so does, uh, we often see more health problems, more heart disease, more forms of cancer, diabetes, because our bodies are under pressure. And so it's important that we think about what are all those things that might be in our pots. And if you want, you can put things in the chat that you know that families are holding, that children are holding. So we know that many families need food. We know that people have been under pressure as they work kind of heroically to support our communities around COVID. We know that each of us has been missing people, our loved ones, and that there are also financial worries. And we know that these are different sources of danger and that sometimes we're even at odds with one another because we are each feeling different dangers differently. Um, and, you know, thinking about illness and loss as well. And then we know that children, there's been a lot of stress trying to learn through the internet, trying to have your parents support you, thinking about how there are sometimes increases in conflict in families as your parents are juggling, not being able to do the things that you wanted to do. And unfortunately, we also have seen a rise in conflict among adults. Um, this being very understandable when you're squeezed from the outside. And so all of this goes into our pots. Um, and what we want to think about is, where do you have a chance to breathe? And so as we look at this picture, I want you to think about what this person, what you are doing is so much more than reading. That you are creating safe spaces where children are breathing, um, where they are connecting, as Dr. Jarvis said, that it is in those magic of those small connections, right? And that there is so much more happening here. And I wanted to share one of my favorite concepts from infant mental health, which is the concept of the protective shield. And this idea that little children believe in some ways that grown-ups are bigger, wiser, stronger kind, that we're all powerful. And if you look at that picture, the two-headed monster is meant to represent danger. And this idea of when there is danger, there is a grown-up who's gotcha. And that that's what allows you to actually grow and thrive and learn because, because your grownups have got you, it's safe to go out into the world. It's safe to explore. It's safe to try new things, right? Because you have a grownup, because if there is danger, your grownup has got you. They'll pull you back in and they'll keep you safe. Now, I want to just go back to this. I think I wasn't covering this, but when we think about all of these stressors, a lot of these stressors are stressors that affect the grownups. And what we know is that little kids, they're sponges. And so part of what they put into their pot is our stress. And it's not like, you know, we don't want to share our stress, but I think of them as spongy for emotions and spongy for danger. And so it's so wise of them to think it's important to me to know if my grown-up is doing okay, because if my grown-up is not doing okay, then I'm not doing okay. 
right? And so all of those sources of stress that are both directly experienced by the child, as well as indirectly experienced because of their proximity to loved ones who are very understandably going through stress, that creates that. And so that's inside them. And so you think about how, as you're going through this, for some children, because their grownups have been having challenges or because there's been danger in the community, they haven't felt like their grownups always have them. And that's really hard, that there is this absence of protection. And sometimes it's a real absence because we know that some grownups have some significant challenges. And sometimes it's that the child perceives the absence even when the grownup is there. And as you look at this picture, I just want you to think about the difference between fear with connection and protection and fear without protection and connection. Because when you look at that, we wanna think about if you are the small child in this image, how do you survive? And this is really kind of understanding what danger does to us. This is understanding when we talk about stress and trauma, we're really talking about what do you do in the face of danger and how the body remembers danger and is sensitive to danger. And what we might see is that some of the patterns of adaptation are things that we might actually call behavior problems. And so one of the ways that you survive, for example, is to think about, I need to fight this thing. And I wanna just sort of share, these are images from a different book, but how animals can help us understand stress response patterns. So one way of fighting might be to sort of bark and growl, like get away from me. Another way might be to be really stinky. I'm gonna spray psh, like skunk. I'm gonna be really kind of repulsive in some ways and push you away. Now, if I can't fight, Maybe if I'm looking at this thing, maybe I need to run. And can you see how rabbit is sort of the symbol of the runner, the very active kid who needs to move and get away. And then another way of running is to turtle up, that I'm actually running away, but by withdrawing, right? And then what we might see is that, oh, and if I can't do that, if I can't fight or run, maybe I... I fall down flat, maybe I freeze, maybe I, I help myself by not being in my body, by not being present. Or maybe I avoid, and that's elephant, not wanting to talk about it or see it. And, or maybe what I need to do is monkey is sort of the little creature who reminds us that they might cling to a new adult who comes through and just say, I need to go with you, will you help me? Or they might try to make nice with this. And in making nice with this creature, they might kind of not be attending to their own needs sometimes because they're always tiptoeing on eggshells. And then we can think about frog. Frog teaches us that some kids actually, in the face of danger, what happens is they lose their voice. You know, like you got a frog in your throat, but they show delays in their development because stress, as Dr. Jarvis showed us, affects your neurons, right? And so this idea that when I'm really stressed, stress can affect the skill that I'm using. It can also affect the grownups around me who are responsible for that beautiful serve and return that helps you develop. And so we can see these changes. And so just remembering in a way that our overarching goal is to regrow the protective shield and to help children to see grownups as bigger, wiser, stronger kind. And just to really, every time they're interacting with you, they're forming a template of this is how most grownups are. And so the words from Jerry Paul and Maria St. John of how you are is as important as what you do. And that this relational magic that you're creating as you read books is that you're the magic. And so as we look at this picture, we think about what are children learning when they're sitting with you? And what they're learning is I am safe here. What they're learning is I am lovable. I am worthy of care. And these are messages that we want all children to have. And unfortunately for some children, these are not their standard messages. And then very importantly, as you are helping them to read at their own speed, wherever it is, what they're learning is I am capable. I am capable of being with someone. I am capable of flipping pages. I am capable of seeing, you know, talking about a book. I am capable about noticing a letter. And what's really important is that often trauma robs people of their sense of competence and capacity. Right, because when you are in danger, often it's the idea that I couldn't do anything, I couldn't stop it. And so having moments where you feel capable and connected, that is the antidote. Um, and so just really thinking about this is a safe base for learning, a safe base for exploration, and holding that they're learning so much um, than reading, much more than reading skills, in addition to the a very important reading skills. And I think we can also think about books providing opportunities. What you read often is important. So if clearly books open the door to joy and to imagination and to connection. 
And some books show children, I'm not the only one. And I love the little boy who said, I love seeing books about black people, Martin Luther King, right? I see myself in these books and I see the strengths of my people. And I, I understand that and I connect to that. I'm not the only one with these strengths, with this voice. I'm also not the only one with these struggles. And then they can also see, I'm, you know, for some books talk about struggles, like seeing a book where a child tantrums. I'm not the only one who tantrums. Oh my goodness, I'm not the only one with hard feelings inside. I'm not stranded. So this idea of fear without connection or fear with this beautiful connection and protection. And I've got a grown up who's saying that there's nothing wrong with this little pot that's blowing up or this kid that's blowing up, that we all feel that way sometimes. Because let's be honest, with COVID, like if we had a show of hands, how many of us have not wanted to have our temper tantrums? We have definitely wanted to. And so being able to really be validated in that of, yes, we don't want to like get all messy, but yes, there are lots of things that we're holding in and we sometimes feel like blowing our lids too. And that you can talk about these things, right? Um, how critical it is to think about that. And these are words from Dan Siegel, um, who you can YouTube, but this idea of what is shareable is bearable. Right. And so what we want is for children, they have stories inside them. So we read stories, but you all know that they have stories. We all have stories inside us. And sometimes in these magic moments, they share them with you. And even when these stories are hard to hear because you wish they didn't have those experience, I want you to hold them like pearls and think this is a child who has trusted me with the hard things. And that what you do is simply by bearing witness, simply by holding it you are helping them to see that they're not alone. You are giving them fear with protection, fear with connection. You are letting them know that these things can be spoken and that is glorious. Um, it's still hard to hear it. And so we all need support as we hear this, but to know that a child is not stranded because that story was inside them no matter what. And what we see is that when it hits the light of day, when it's not stuck in their pot, development thrives. And so another thing that we might hold is that Dan Siegel says that we name it to tame it. And so talking about our feelings, this idea that in early childhood, we often don't know, like, this is frustration, this is rage, this is righteous anger, this is sadness. What we know is this is the way my body feels, it feels really icky. And so having somebody accompany you on this journey is really key. And to know that you don't have to hold it in and that the antidote is to be held in your feelings. So as we think about books that can open doors to conversation, I wanted to share some free resources. And so this is a free disaster series that we developed. And unfortunately, I know that Florida is often affected by hurricanes. And so there is a version for hurricanes and for COVID and just for you all to, to develop jointly with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network to know about this resource, where you basically, you meet a couple of little friends, Trinka and Sam, and you learn about the disaster and how it affected them. And, you know, just thinking about the hurricane and just think about this as stories opening a door, right? So that children might diverge from the book. And that's great because where they're going is to where they need to go. It's not about getting through a book. It's getting into a story. And that in the stories, we actually see the little reactions of the little creatures, which is also like, oh, they're not behaving in ideal ways, but they're behaving in very understandable ways. They're not sleeping well. They're kind of pissed off. And then very beautifully, we see how grownups, how their parents support them, how they get cuddles, how they move to get the icky out, how they talk about what they went through, right? And then we see lovingly how the community comes together. And so we just wanted children to have a coloring book and communities to have a free coloring book that they could use to start conversations. And there's a parent guide in the back so that we can have books also that show children that when there are hard times, we come together. When there are hard times, you're not alone and that you can talk about these hard times. Now, as you're reading the books, I think it's very important that you understand a couple of core trauma concepts. And this is one that I, oops, that I really hold, which is the idea of reminders. And so if you think about, you know, a hurricane or something, there are often things long after the hurricane has ended that remind you of the hurricane, right? Like when you get sort of windy weather um, and that you can notice your body amping up. Right? And just think about these things remind you of danger. And your body amping up is your body's wisdom because what your body is saying is danger is coming, get ready. 
And yet it's very inconvenient if there isn't danger because then we're freaking out and we're often behaving very poorly. And so I often use the metaphor of pollen. And so just thinking about um, trauma and you know, if you think about P PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, it's a lot like asthma where you don't cure asthma, you manage it. And so if you are working with a child or a person or yourself and you've experienced danger, what you wanna honor is that there may be things in the environment that act as pollen. And when you're exposed to pollen, you might turn to your stress response pattern. So you might be like turtle and turtle up. Yo, I didn't even talk about squirrel, which is funny because I am squirrel. Squirrel chatters endlessly about things. You might just sort of talk, start talking endlessly about things or like, you know, eat, eat a lot of nuts. That's me too. You know, like, <laughs> it's not nuts, it's chocolate. But, you know, you just might notice that you go into your stress response pattern when you hit pollen. And so we want to be thinking, what is the pollen for a child? And unfortunately, I want to tell you that pollen sometimes shows up in books. So I wanted you to know this. So here's a little example about a lovely little story about a bear. But what if you're sitting with a child and the child thinks, oh, my daddy gave me a teddy bear. And then the child's mind jumps to my daddy is not with us. I miss him. What you might notice is that the book has become a reminder. And in this case, it's a reminder of loss of my daddy's not with us. And so you might see an affective shift in the child where some kids, they're like rabbit and they move around a lot. Other kids, they're like dog and all of a sudden they become kind of obnoxious and you're like, what's going on? You know, why can't, why, you know, why are they being like this? And for some children also what happens is as they think about this, my daddy's not with us, they might remember that there was conflict in the home, that things were scary. And then the book might actually carry a trauma reminder, which might mean that you start to see more and more behavior. Now, what I would say is there's nothing wrong with the book. This is gonna happen. And different children, because of their experience, different things in different books might trigger them. So for some children, it's just actually seeing a family because their family has had problems. Maybe seeing a grandparent who might've passed from COVID. I just want you to be aware of this. It's hard because if you notice that as you're reading and a child needs to shift and move away, honor the body's wisdom. And think about, I don't know what's in this book, but maybe this kid does need to wiggle. And how do we go back to that relationship and think here you are safe to wiggle? And how might you understand? I often in, in our training of child parent psychotherapists, I use these metaphors. So I think about our bodies as cups and when your cup gets full and when your cup gets full, you need to regulate, right? And if you look at the thermometer below, some people when their cup gets full, it's like they get fried and they, they sort of tilt over and it's sort of overwhelming and other people to protect them, their body numbs out, they go into the blue zone. And so just watching what happens to this person and if their cup gets full, children often try to do things to regulate. They try to move, they try to snuggle, they might try to do a different activity and we wanna be aware of that. And then sometimes they come back to the book, but more in terms of looking at it and they might even talk about what's in it. Like some kids you might have noticed that if you have a book with an angry face, they just whoop, don't like that angry face. And then that dialogue would be around, oh, you don't like it when people get mad, right? And you know, we might think about how, yeah, it's hard. We all get mad sometimes, but sometimes we don't like it because it has been scary. So just holding this, and I really wanted to honor your role in what you do and that you are really helping children to see that they're not alone and that we're honoring when we can help their parents as well. I loved watching the video and seeing parents also say the joy that Reading Pals gave to that because they can also see that their child is growing and thriving and that their child runs home and shares and says, look what I did today. And what they're getting a sense of also, especially when the danger is really big, it's not sufficient that it just be the parent alone who's a protective shield. When there's a really big danger, like with COVID or with other things, what families really need to know is that there's a shield in front of them and that that shield is work, neighborhood, school, and reading pals. Just think about how we give a moment of peace and respite to, to the family, how we give a growing competence to the family when you do these things. And that this also, as we think about funding and policies for this, this is society. This is our culture, our policies, where we say, we got you, right? So if we can say, we've got you, school. We've got you, teachers. We know you're stressed. We're giving you a moment of peace where we're, we're part of your team in building competence, peace, and relationship. And that is glorious and that that trickles down to the family and to the child. 
And so I just wanted to thank all of you who are reading pals. I'm here if you have questions, um, but just really wanted to celebrate 10 years and hope um, to celebrate more in the future. So thank you all. And there are some resources. There's a free webinar if you want to dive deeper into thinking about stress and trauma. Y también para todos los que hablan español, muchísimas gracias. También el seminario de web también está en español. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chandra. I'm seeing a lot of affirmations in the chat that this is definitely resonating. And I know for me as a mother, as a Reading Pals volunteer, as a friend, as a human, it's so important to have these reminders of, you know, when you, it's one thing to read Hold and Pot and, and as adults, we, we can see the message that's coming, but it's another thing to look at a beloved book like Corduroy and, and take a moment to think about what, what may come up and and just the, the the images you have given all of us to to think about you know my body feels icky you sense that but what, how do you name it and and what is our role as as volunteers to learn how to react to some of these things and how to be part of that protective shield and and, and understand that and I I think a, a couple of other images I'm leaving with are, are this idea of holding as pearls the the nuggets that, that may not be so nice that you know the, the stories that a child shares and sort of reframing that really important and 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 also the importance of diversity appreciate that your resources are available in Spanish also really important in in our state I know in your state too but just I see the strengths of my people you 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 said and and it's it's important the role that that we all play in that and then, of course, the poem. Um, and so it, we have just a couple of, of minutes left, and, and I'm not seeing any particular questions about the, the presentation. Um, so just take a moment to thank you again for, for being with us. I'm sure through your website, you may get some comments and questions later, and, and you may see an uptick in traffic as all of us here um, take a look at those resources. Um, so wish we had more time to, to really open up a conversation, but that will have to be for the next time. Um, thank you again to all of you for joining us today. A quick reminder to the Reading Pals, uh, you, you, you are hopefully today refreshed in, in knowing uh, the impact that you're making and why we all do this work. So we hope you will sign up to be a Reading Pal again for the upcoming school year. And you've seen in the chat, if you need any more information, send it to that Reading Pals email address, uh, readingpals at childrensmovementflorida.org. Um, really great to, to be with you all, to share in all of this energy. Special thanks again to Dr. Jarvis and Dr. Ghosh Ippen for being with us and, and sharing just such dynamic presentations that we will remember for a long time to come. Thank you again to uh, our founder, Dave Lawrence, uh, to John Knight, who began this program and continues to support it, and of course to the Barnett family for making all of this possible uh, and, and being in the background as we all connect. Um, just, just a reminder, celebrating 10 years and more than 25,000 children in Florida who have been paired with a mentor. Um, you you know now why why John Knight is always saying this isn't just a reading a, a reading program, a reading intervention. This is about building relationships and mentors. So um, we will let you all go on time and wish you a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you very much.